welcome back to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. Today we have the amazing Hayley Russ joining us for an incredible chat on acne. Before we dive into the episode, I wanted to give you a little bit more info on the lovely Haley. So she's actually one of the incredibly knowledgeable, compassionate rock star naturopaths on our NKD practitioner team, which I am so stoked about. She is a degree qualified naturopath with a special interest in digestive, hormonal, skin, thyroid, nervous system and mood wellness and bloody brilliant at it if I do say so myself. Outside of being a genius contributor to our programs and one-to-one consultations, she loves spending quality time in the sun with her puppy, a cuppa and a good book. She's also had her own journey with overcoming skin issues. So not only is she the perfect person to speak about this topic from a knowledge perspective, she also really gets it, which I think always adds a little bit of something, something, you know, Haley's approach to health and healing is in complete alignment with how we love to practice and do business and heal you guys over here in the clinic and in the programs. And that is that it's holistic, it's realistic, and it focuses on focus focuses on getting to the root cause of symptoms. So you can absolutely follow Haley over on Instagram. I'll make sure her account is linked in the post that goes up for this episode as well as in the show notes and pop her website in the show notes as well. Let's dive in, shall we? Haley Brass, welcome to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. How fun is this? Thank you so much for having me. I feel so excited. I feel excited. I mean, we've had a bit of like a, a rough a rough time in the background here getting our thing to record, which has never happened before. We can't even blame it on like Mercury retrograde, which is unfortunate. Just blame it on me. It's fine. Yeah, I wish I could, except it's really not. It really wasn't you this time. <laughs> That's okay. That's all good. So let us jump straight in because I know this topic is one that we haven't spoken about on the podcast for a very, very, very long time. And it's a topic that comes up actually a fair bit. And I know it's come up for you a lot in clinic as well. So I thought who better and what better time to have a proper chat about all things acne. So where I thought we would start is just around if you could explain a little bit more about, you know, whether there are different types of acne and and what they might be. Yeah, of course. So um, the first type of acne is called acne vulgaris. So that's the most common form of acne. um, And that's the one we'll probably be talking about mostly today. So Acne vulgaris kind of includes blackheads and whiteheads. So it's typically the mildest form of acne and it's a non-inflammatory form. Um, Then some other forms you've got are sort of papules, which are, you know, pink and solid and raised, pustules, which are more like, you know, uh, whiteheads that are a bit more inflamed. Then you've got your more severe forms of acne. So, for example, nodular acne. Um, that's where you get the hard, large, painful bumps and they're quite deep underneath the skin um, and cystic acne as well. So that occurs even further below the skin um, or deeper in the skin than nodules. Um, and that form can be quite painful. It's the largest form of acne. Um, but unlike the nodular acne, they're actually soft. So they're not hard like the nodular mm-hmm. acne. And then you've got an even more severe form of acne, which is called acne conglobata. Um, and that's, oh, that's often, a mouthful. I know, right? <laughs> um, <Good job. laughs> <Conglobata. laughs> um, and that one is more common in men, um, but it's, you know, very inflamed, very painful kind. Um, and it can, you know, leave scarring and things like that too. Then we have acne rosacea, which is kind of a different, um, a different thing altogether. Um, but that's more of a red kind of rash uh, that happens, inflammation kind of across the, the face, so the cheeks and nose. Um, but that's a different form, so we probably won't talk about that one today. But, yeah, they're the kind of main main forms, really. Yeah, wow. It's it's interesting how there are so many forms within what we all just would assume is just acne. And um, I love that you explain those different ones there. And, and yes, I think we'll, we'll leave the acne rosacea as a whole other kettle of uh, fish to um, unravel at some point in time. So as I guess as a practitioner, as a, as a naturopath, as someone who's approaching it from a whole body picture, where do you kind of look to start when someone presents with acne? 
So um, as you would know, Nat, when we have patients come in, like it's never just one thing, right? We're complicated beings. There's always more than one thing going on. So there can be lots of different contributing factors when it comes to acne. But, you know, the two, the two things that I start with first are generally our hormonal health. That can be a really big driver of acne and also our gut health too. So those two are my first go-tos. Um, but then I also look at things like our liver function, you know, and our detox pathways. How well are we actually sort of eliminating our hormones and our toxins and things like that? Also, um, lifestyle wise, you know, hygiene and stress and, and those kinds of components. Also, diet wise, like, are we eating a lot of inflammatory foods? Are we eating a lot of sugar? Um, have we got a, like a nutrient deficient sort of diet? We don't have the nutrients that we actually need for our skin healing. Um, and then I also look at the bacterial component as well. So we can have, you know, the topical bacteria going on on the surface of the skin, but also um, a gut-driven kind of bacterial dysbiosis as well. So there's definitely a few different things that we need to look at when it comes to acne. Yeah, it's it's so so true. And it's sometimes I find it takes a bit of explaining or convincing to patients for them to understand that although they're coming in for a skin issue that we actually need to start in the gut usually and then that's going to have flow on effects outside of that because one mistake that I see a lot of people doing is trying to just either treat it, treat it topically mm-hmm. or trying to like go down that real liver detox you know, avenue without actually fixing up the gut because as we know, you can't possibly detox someone effectively if you don't have your bowels moving, for example, or that isn't functioning well. So I love that you specified gut and hormones as, you know, the foundations and then moving on to liver and detox pathways and everything else that you mentioned there. So with that in mind, because you know that I love me a bit of gut health, what role does the gut have in acne? So it's actually huge. And I often will start with the gut before I start with hormones to be completely honest, because we have actually what's called the gut skin access. So this is this relationship between the gut and the skin. So um, it's really important that we're working on the gut f- gut first because, as you sort of just alluded to, our gut is a major route of elimination. So if we're not having our regular bowel movements, so essentially, you know, pooing out our excess hormones and our ex- you know, our toxins and wastes and things like that, if we're not eliminating them, them properly, what's going to happen is they're going to be reabsorbed into our system. So that can obviously throw out our hormonal balance, um, you know, so if we come in and we start working on hormones straight away, but we're not eliminating, that's kind of, you know, not addressing the root cause really. So often the gut is sometimes more important to start with than hormones themselves. So our elimination is a really important thing to consider. And, you know, studies have shown that acne patients or people with acne are more likely to experience gastrointestinal issues. So things like constipation or reflux or bloating. So, if we're not eliminating these toxins, basically, they can then cause a bit of an overburden situation happening in the liver. So mm-hmm. our toxins, toxins and waste are going to be recirculated there. Um, and if those, those elimination pathways aren't working, our skin is also a route of elimination. So it's going to be required to pick up the slack if those, those pathways aren't working. So those intestinal bacteria and toxic metabolites can actually accumulate in our skin and then that causes acne and other skin conditions. So the importance of the gut really can't be overstated. Um, And also we need to look at whether or not we've got a healthy balance of bacteria in our gut too. So this, um, you know, dysbiosis basically, which is an imbalance in the good and bad bacteria can affect our skin too. So like we talked about before, you know, those... um, bacterial metabolites can become, you know, can accumulate in the skin causing acne. And something that I like to talk to my patients about is, you know, a good clue. If they've been prescribed, for example, a round of doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, you know, for for bacterial infections, and it can often be prescribed for acne. Mm -hmm. So if they've been prescribed that and they've found that they've actually had some improvement in their acne, um, that can be a really good sign that it is a bacterially driven problem or, you know, that's a, an important component in their presentation. So, you know, often what can happen though is they take the round of doxycycline and then eventually the acne just comes back because it hasn't quite hit the mark. So that shows to me that, you know, we need to do some gut work there too. 
And Mm. the last thing with acne as well would be when it comes to the gut would be whether or not we actually have sufficient sort of stomach acid too. So we require quite a a low pH in the stomach. So 1.5 to 3.5, which is really low. And the reason that we need that is to actually break down our foods adequately so we can absorb these nutrients, um, particularly those ones that are needed for skin repair too. So, and if we have that imbalance in, um, or sorry, not enough stomach acid, basically we can end up with that bacterial imbalance too. So, um, you know, SIBO, and I know there's something that you see a lot in your clinic too, um, and there's a link between SIBO and acne. So, yeah, the gut is probably the most important place to start. Oh, so what a good summary. I love that because it's so, so true and it is it is so complex, but it also doesn't have to be when you're in the hands of the right practitioner and the right container. There is, you know, a method to our madness often in working through a lot of these different things. And I just wanted to add to, so for people listening with low stomach acid, um, it's not, it's it's often hard for people to identify uh without knowing, okay, what, what are the clues? So sometimes I like to share with patients, like some hints that you might have low stomach acid. Uh, if you feel quite full, as soon as you start eating, Mm -hmm. if you feel like you can't digest animal protein very well, like you have that sense of like, oh, it's just sitting in my stomach is another one. Um, also, if you feel like you burp a fair bit would be another one trying to think if there are any other ones off the top of my head can you think of any extras that i haven't mentioned there um i think bloating is a really big one too Mm, yeah yeah. if we're not digesting you know our our food properly when it passes into you know the rest of our digestive tract it can we can have fermentation and bloating and things like that happening too so they kind of all indicate to me that you know we might have an issue with our stomach acid love it love 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 it okay so we've spoken about gut health and its role in acne and before we also mentioned that hormones do definitely come into play here so can you explain or expand on what role hormones do have in acne yeah so um yeah hormones are essential that we assess those ones as well um and when i talk about hormones i'm talking about a few different types of hormones as well so first of all we have our sex hormones or reproductive hormones Then we have our blood sugar hormones and also our stress hormones. So first of all, when it comes to our our sex hormones, what I like to assess in my patients are their androgen levels or their testosterone levels. So to sort of simplify um, the process, basically when we have elevated androgens, this increases our sebum levels. Um, Then we end up with all this inflammation in our skin and we end up with acne. So that's a simplified version of that. But basically our androgens are very important when it comes to our acne um, acne occurring. So we need to sort of have a look at what's happening hormonally. Um, and often what I do with patients is sort of actually ask questions around like the location of their acne. So, you know, we all know that the, the chin and jawline is often um, the place that one of the places that is affected with acne, but I I like to ask if patients are presenting with the acne on their back and their chest as well. So that can be a sign, um, you know, that obviously there's androgens elevated, but also that can be a PCOS sign too, which, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I know you've talked about before in the past too. Um, So Mm. yeah, that's a, a, you know, can be an androgen driven condition as well. So we can look at um, what, what's going on with our androgens so to see if that is contributing to the acne for that particular patient. So that's our reproductive hormones. Obviously, we look at the rest of the hormones as well in balance because it's all about balance, but, you know, it's often those androgens that are quite elevated in relation to the rest of our hormones. Mm-hmm. So the next one I'd look at is our blood sugar hormones. So, for example, our insulin, which kind of controls our blood sugar levels. So you know, our typical Western kind of diet that has got a lot of high glycemic index foods. So things like, you know, lots of sugar or refined carbohydrates, you know, your white, white foods, so white pasta, white potatoes, you know, white bread, all that kind of stuff. So Mm. that can spike our insulin levels, which is our blood sugar hormone. Um, And that then increases what's called insulin growth like factor that then triggers our sebum and our androgens, acne, et cetera. So looking at our blood sugar and our diet is really important in acne too. And then the last one, which is so important as well, and I think this is one that's often overlooked, is actually our stress hormones. So 
cortisol and you know who isn't stressed in the 21st century right particularly mm. the way the world's going at the moment i think there's a lot of stress around so yes. basically our cortisol which is our stress hormone it directly interacts with our oil glands so it can worsen acne so basically yeah just upregulates our sebum production and can cause and can um, aggravate the acne that we already have as well so dealing with our stress is very important too so yeah when it comes to hormones i look at the reproductive or sex hormones our blood sugar hormones and then our stress hormones yeah wow very comprehensive and it again it comes back to treating the body as a whole and not just looking at where the issue is being expressed i.e the skin but actually where is the root of that and there is always as you said in the very beginning there's no matter what issue we're talking about there's always an interplay and i would argue that like the gut is almost always involved in in pretty much everything so <laughs> i i love that i love that we're covering all of this so i want to move into a little bit more um about dietary recommendations because i know this is a question that i get asked a lot i know that you would be asked it a lot and i think it's something that is relevant and also quite practical that people could start to experiment with or implement as well so when it does come to treatment strategies and diet what have you seen work really well in most people? So this is actually quite exciting, really, because there's so many different things that we can do with the diet. So um, and the beauty of naturopathy and nutrition is that, you know, we treat everybody as an individual. So, you know, recommendations are going to differ from person to person. But there are a few great places that we can start that a lot of people do get, um, you know, resolution from. So the first one and, you know, I can, I can see people around that are listening to this just going to be sad about this one, but eliminating dairy can be a really big trigger for a lot of people. So I know, you know, cheese is delicious, but it often doesn't love us back. So um, our dairy can stimulate, you know, what we we're talking about before, basically that insulin growth-like factor, which then stimulates our, our androgens and our sebum production in our skin. So it can definitely be a big trigger for a lot of people. So I would recommend eliminating dairy for a period and seeing if that makes a difference for you. So at least sort of six weeks for that one. Um, so that's dairy. That's the first one. The second one is also eliminating sugar and those like high glycemic foods. So, you know, um, like we were talking about before, those really refined foods. So replacing those with our whole grain options, you know, our buckwheat pasta, our quinoa, our brown rice. So, you know, those, those more whole food versions of those foods. To keep that. What about, what about fruit, Haley? Because I know that that's a question that will come up because often there's this confusion around when I know for me, if I say to clients, you know, eliminate sugar, there, there's this assumption that, okay, I have to not have any fruit at all. What's your, what's your perspective or your opinion or your recommendation when you are getting acne patients to eliminate sugar? Where does fruit sit on that spectrum? Yeah, look, so I think, um, you know, two serves of fruit per day is okay. Um, and, you know, there's, there's probably better choices that you can make as well. So, you know, things like your berries have got, you know, they're high in antioxidants, which is going to help improve our skin quality and things like that. There are those higher GI fruits as well. So, for example, things like grapes, they can be really high in sugar. So I guess keeping that, uh, that fruit intake to that moderate two sort of serves a day and just choosing, um, you know, the less sugary versions. And also what you can do as well, if you are going to eat that fruit, eat it with a protein source at the same time too, just to help stabilize those blood sugar levels a little bit more. So, you know, and, and if you're eating fruit, obviously we're talking about whole fruit. We're not talking about things like dried fruit, for example, that has, you know, the fiber yeah. and things like that taken out and it's literally just, you know, um, concentrated sugar really. Or so, juice, like everyone <laughs> calm your farm and stop drinking juice. I just exactly. can't even. Yeah, I know. Even those green juices sometimes that people think, <sighs> um, are, you know, really healthy, like you look at it and they might have, yeah, anyway, an insane amount of sugar in there. So, yeah, look, I think I'm a very much, you know, moderation and stuff like that. But with the fruit, I think we do need to keep that to about two serves per day. But like I said, every person is different. So it's about what, what works for the individual person. But that's a general kind of recommendation there. Love that. What else? Yeah. What else is important? Yeah, so also increasing fibre. So basically when we eat fibre, it helps to bind excess hormones and toxins and eliminate them. So that's a really simple thing that we can do too. Um, and it also helps to feed our beneficial bacteria in the gut. So, you know, fibre is a, a really big one. 
Um, also making sure we're eating enough protein. So basically our protein contains, you know, our amino acids that we need to help with our skin repair and it stabilizes our blood sugars like we um, mentioned a second ago. Um, also zinc rich foods is really important. So that helps with our skin repair and a bunch of other things too. So zinc is really important. Um, and zinc rich foods are actually often low in a vegan or vegetarian diet. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind too. Mm. Um, yeah. And probiotic rich foods can be quite helpful. So for that bacterial balance in the gut, so things like sauerkraut, kombucha, you know, coconut yogurt. Um, but obviously, you know, if you're a SIBO, you know, you're suspecting some SIBO or dysbiosis going on in the gut, then I would tread carefully here. Um, but obviously a practitioner can help you with that too. And then the, yeah, one of the last things is also just reducing inflammatory foods and, one of the things that can be kind of hidden that people don't really think about would be your sort of inflammatory vegetable oils as well. So things like canola or sunflower oil, safflower oil. So they can sneak in. literally the- hidden everywhere, right? Like everywhere. Just like, just like relax, just stop <laughs> being everywhere. It, it's, I often try and teach people to start to turn packets around because I think there is just this automatic assumption when something says, you know, I don't know, gluten-free or low sugar or sugar-free or keto or whatever on the front that, oh, it must be good for me. And I just, I think, you know, turn those packets around, people, turn them around and have a look at whether or not any of those inflammatory vegetable oils oils are in there because if you can eliminate, like you can only control what you can control, right? And Mm -hmm. I usually say to people, look, when you eat out, which you're going to do because life is social and, and that's an important component, you are going to get exposed to some vegetable oils because it's very rare that uh, cafes and restaurants aren't using that. So allow that to be your time where there is a bit of exposure. But when you're buying foods yourself and you're bringing them into your home, that's when you want to be a bit more of a like a bit more like strict about it for lack of a better word, because that way, when you do get those micro exposures, when you're eating out and filling up your social cup, you're not going to tip yourself over the edge because I've certainly seen myself when I've had too many vegetable oils, when I've actually just been traveling and had to eat out a fair bit, it Mm -hmm. absolutely impacts my skin. I don't necessarily have acne, but I started to get relatively bad skin purely from that. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, they're sort of, they're sort of ubiquitous, like they're everywhere. So I guess mm-hmm. it's just about, yeah, making better choices where you can definitely. Yeah. But yeah eating yeah. out can be a bit tricky, but like you said, I think it's more focusing on what you can control and what you put in your trolley. So definitely. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing I just wanted to reiterate there as well is, um, which you already said, but I just want to remind people, cause I think this one can really catch people off guard as well, is that It is so important to work with a practitioner when you've got acne or or gut issues going on because while we're saying to you that increasing fiber can be beneficial for acne, we also see all of the time in our gut rescue program and when we're working with uh, patients who have some of these issues that if there is SIBO, if there is um, certain types of gut issues going on, increasing fiber straight away without actually addressing the underlying root cause will worsen your symptoms, not help them. So that's why Haley's saying, you know, work with a practitioner. This is general advice. It has to be personalized to you. So making sure that if you do for any reason, try some of these strategies on your own and you're not seeing the progress that you assumed, then reach out um, to us and get some help because it may be that we need to kind of back it up a bit and then move you like a bit slower through the process of increasing things like fiber and fermented foods and um, going out, going about it a little bit of a different way. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. All right. So supplements, supplements is naturally the next thing that always comes (laughs) up. And I, and I am really fascinated by this because I do think that there are a lot of nutrients and herbs that can work really well. And I'd love to hear what your opinion or like what your opinion is here in terms of what supplements, whether that be nutrients or nutrients or herbs, do you kind of have in your toolkit that you find helpful when you're treating an acne patient? Yeah. So look, there's definitely lots of different things that we can try, but, you know, like you said, I definitely wouldn't start with all of these things and, you know, throw everything in the toolkit that we have because that can be too much sometimes. So it's, again, it depends on 
the driver of the acne? You know, is it hormonally driven? Is it gut driven? Is it because there's nutritional gaps in the diet? Like there's lots of inflammation, you know, it's going to depend on the individual person and the individual presentation and what else is going on for that patient. But, you know, one of the things that I love, you know, that I do start with is um, a good quality zinc supplement. And like with a lot of supplements, not all zinc supplements are the same. So it's making sure that we're getting, you know, a good quality zinc supplement that's actually going to help. So our zinc is so important because it helps with our um, hormonal regulation. So basically it helps to inhibit this certain enzyme, which for the nerds out there is 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which basically, you know, um, is involved in our androgen production. So it helps to re regulate that pathway. It's really important for our skin healing. So the actual healing of the acne lesions themselves, it reduces the excess production of sebum and yeah, it does so many other things for our hormone hormonal system too. So it helps with our progesterone and our ovarian follicles and lots of different things. So zinc is one of those things that ticks so many different boxes. Um, but yeah, you know, we have to make sure we're getting a good quality form of zinc. I have a crush on zinc and it's a really close tie between like magnesium and zinc. I think I would choose like in terms of just my love generally. Yeah. <laughs> of it's like I feel like I have two children. I'm like, look, magnesium, you are actually my favorite, but zinc also, I love you. <laughs> oh, you're a close second zinc. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the backup child that will do. <laughs> Totally. No, zinc is so important and it can be quite deficient in our diets, which is crazy, but um, mm. that's a really important one to start with. Um, from that sort of gut dysbiosis, bacterial imbalance perspective that we we're talking about as well, um, probiotics can be quite helpful, but that goes along with the same caveat that we we're talking about before. So depending on what gut issues are going on will dictate whether or not that's appropriate for you. So probiotics can be helpful. They can also aggravate in certain people. So that's a case by case um, one there. Uh, vitamin A is quite helpful too. So that's needed for our skin healing, our collagen synthesis, all of those things. Um, but again, you can't have that if you're on Rakutane. So, you know, case by case basis. Also things like vitamin C. So we know that we need that for helping to reduce inflammation and skin healing. Um, it's also important for collagen formation and then, you know, decreasing um, severity of acne and scarring and things like that too. Um, and then, you know, omega-3s are quite important too. So omega-3s being in things like our wild-caught salmon, our nuts and seeds, avocado, et cetera. So omega-3s um, are really potent anti-inflammatory um, compounds. So they help to reduce the inflammation associated with acne and the sebum production. Um, and, yeah, like we were talking about before, we want to make sure that we're reducing those omega-6 foods, which are often in those vegetable oils and stuff like that too. So there's lots of other supplements that you can do as well. We can jump more into liver, um, you know, liver support, hormone support, all that kind of stuff. But I like to sort of start with the really foundational kind of things. So that's often yeah. where I start. I love that. I could not agree more because I think that often if we get the foundations right, there's less of a need for more supplements um, as we go. So I, I love that you start there and really supporting the basics so that, yeah, there's just less money and less time wasted on using things that may or may not be necessary as well. Exactly. So the next little area I want to move into, which I'm going to try and keep calm while we talk about, <laughs> um, yeah. is around the pill and resorting to the pill when there are skin issues and I'm I'm not mad about it because people do it I'm mad about it because people do it without being informed properly and with 100. misinformation 100%. so with that in mind tell us a little bit more about why potentially using the pill to fix quote-unquote fix mm -hmm. skin issues is maybe not the greatest idea Okay. Yeah. So I'm also going to try and keep this calm, like you said. Um, <laughs> Take a breath. It's such a can of worms. But first of all, what I want to say is, look, you know, your body, your choice, you do whatever is best for you. But the most important thing I want you to do is to actually make an informed choice. So you have the information and you make the decision based on that. You do the, the way up, the cost to benefit ratio. And if it's the right thing for you, then you know what? You do you, boo. That's amazing. Go for it. Yes, but 100%. Yeah, it's all about being informed. So there are a few issues that I have with the pill. So the first one is that 
like you said, it's not a fix. It's not a long-term solution. It's a bit of a Band-Aid solution. So basically how the pill works is that it maintains a high level, like a high concentration of synthetic hormones in our bloodstream. So this basically then prevents the production of our own endogenous hormones. It blocks the release of our follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormones from our pituitary and it prevents ovulation. That's my second point. So I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, Mm -hmm. you know, these synthetic hormones that we're taking actually suppress our sebum levels to that of a child. Does that sound like a normal, healthy kind of... Oh, it sounds so normal. I cannot (laughs) wait to get on board. I know, right? So basically we need sebum as well. Like sebum is important. It helps to keep our skin healthy and moist. And if we don't have enough sebum, basically we, we get dry, cracking skin. So, you know, look, that's why the oral contraceptive pill can be helpful in reducing acne while you're taking it. But when you stop taking it, that's a whole other thing. So Mm. that's my first concern with the pill is that it's not really fixing the underlying cause. The second issue with the pill that I have is that it suppresses ovulation. And we know that ovulation is the only way that we can actually make progesterone. So, and, you know, a lot of women out there are probably thinking, well, what does it matter about progesterone? Like, I'm not wanting to have a baby right now, you know, et cetera. But we know that progesterone is so important beyond fertility. Obviously, it's essential for fertility, but it confers so many other benefits that are so important to our overall health. So basically our progesterone helps to reduce our anxiety. So, um, you know, there's a metabolite of progesterone, allopregnenolone, which I know you call allo. I love (laughs) saying that word, allopregnenolone. Don't you just feel instantly smarter and just fancy? (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Um, Basically basically allo, our mate allo. um, Our mate allo. (laughs) That binds to our um, GABA receptors and that's basically a, um, you know, one of our calming brain chemicals. So progesterone is amazing for reducing anxiety and helping us to feel calm and for sleep and stuff like that. It's also really important for lightening periods, boosting thyroid function. It's anti-inflammatory. It's great for our hair, skin and nails. Look, progesterone is just like this superstar that we want, we want in our lives. So by taking the oral contraceptive pill, it basically suppresses ovulation, no progesterone. So that's my second problem with the pill. Um, and just a, a side note as well. So the synthetic progestins that you find in the oral contraceptive pill are not the same as progesterone. So don't let anybody Thank you. try and tell you yes. that they are. <laughs> yes, I just, I get so frustrated at that. I mean, I just, it's not the same thing. And I, I just, if, if you take nothing away from this podcast but that, I will be a happy camper that, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different molecule, although it like sounds similar, progestin and progesterone, Mm -hmm. ain't nobody fooling anyone. They are completely different and therefore they behave differently in your body. So just as Hayley was saying there of all the benefits of progesterone, it's absolutely not the case if you're taking a progestin, which is what is in a lot of these um, hormonal contraceptives. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like a side note, tangent, because I love a good tangent. Um, But, you know, the amount of women that kind of come off the pill and then feel like a completely different person and it's like, well, you know what, that's a big part of that right there. So Mm. just saying. Um, But my third problem with the pill as well in, in this context is that, you know, it actually does deplete a lot of the nutrients that we need for healthy skin. So things like our, our vitamin C and E and your two favorite children, magnesium and zinc, you know, um, and then also our B vitamins and stuff. So we need those nutrients for healthy skin, but obviously healthy thyroid function and so many other processes in the body. So you know, like I said, make an informed choice for you. If it's the right decision for you, then go ahead. But make sure you know, um, you, you have all the information and you can do that cost to benefit ratio and make the decision for yourself. So, but yeah, unfortunately, it's not, it's not a long-term solution. It's not a fix, which is, yeah, mm, my main problem. Yeah, 100%. And I, that naturally leads me to my next question, because this is something that comes up a lot in clinic as well. And it's, I guess the question around or the issue around or the fear around women who have been on the pill and they're coming off the pill and they're really super worried about what is going to happen to their skin. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for those people? 
Yeah, look, I I totally understand this. This is a really big fear. It's a really common fear. And particularly if women went on the pill initially because they had problems with acne. So, like, I understand that it's a real fear to kind of come off the pill because of what, what might actually happen. And unfortunately, I do have a little bit of bad news when it comes to this, is that post-pill acne can often get worse before it gets better. And sometimes it can actually peak about six months after coming off the pill. So, and the reason that this happens is because our birth control pills, like we talked about before, they suppress our endogenous production of hormones. And that includes, they, you know, suppressing our androgen levels, which is obviously what's a big player in our acne production. So when we stop the pill, what happens is because those hormone levels have been suppressed for so long, our body actually upregulates the production of these um, androgens and sebum in an attempt to kind of find equilibrium, you know, find a balance. So when you stop taking the oral contraceptive pill, our sebum levels can increase dramatically and rebound to be higher than they even were before you went on the pill. So that's a problem. And also your ovaries can actually temporarily increase androgen production too when they're trying to find this balance. So that's why we can often get, you know, acne so much worse after stopping the pill than before we even went on the pill. So, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's definitely things that we can do. So what I would recommend is that before you actually come off the pill, you start a few different bits and pieces to sort of help to regulate this process. So um, you know, one of the things that you can do is start taking a good quality zinc suppl- uh, good quality zinc supplement. So like what we talked about before, you know, zinc is so important for hormonal regulation, skin healing, all of those things. It's such a superstar. Um, and also increasing our dietary zinc intake as well. So that's the first thing that I would start with before coming off the pill. Mm-hmm. Um, other things that we can do as well would be to support our liver function. So crazy little side note, the synthetic estrogen found in the oral contraceptive pill is actually four times stronger than our own estrogen that we make. So that's kind of crazy, right? Mm. Yeah. So it's important that we help to support our liver to kind of clear out these synthetic um, hormones. And then we can kind of encourage our own production of the hormones and ovulation as well. So, you know, there's different herbs that we can take to sort of support our hormone clearance, support our liver function. Um, But I also love our dietary um, interventions that we can do as well. So eating our cruciferous or brassica kind of veggies. So lots of broccoli and, you know, broccoli sprouts, all those kinds of veggies um, can be really great for helping to metabolize our estrogen. So um, that's a, a great thing to start with as well. Um, Also, if you went on the pill because you have endometriosis or PCOS, um, I would recommend sort of working with a practitioner as well to start treating these conditions prior to stopping the oral contraceptive pill too, to sort of get ahead on those ones. Um, And also just making sure you're eating enough foods to sort of support our ovulation as well. So it's it's quite an energy dependent thing that happens in our body. So we need to make sure we're actually nourishing our body and getting the nutrients we need. Um, in order to ovulate and have a regular cycle. Um, Yeah, and there's other different things that we can do as well to support the hormones. But what I like to do is kind of give ourselves three months of being off the pill before jumping in too much with hormone regulating herbs, just to kind of give us our body a chance to find its own equilibrium. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's definitely things that we can do to sort of reduce that likelihood of getting that post-pill acne. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know about you, Haley, but if I have the chance with someone, I often say, you know, like, let's do a couple of months of putting some of these things in place and then start coming off the pill so that we've kind of got a little bit more um, up our sleeve. It's not to say you have to do it that ba- that way, but if you know that you want to come off the pill, reach out sooner rather than later because there are things that we can start to do that is going to help in that process. And it's well and truly worth it. Although, as Haley said, sometimes it can get worse before it gets better. We can negate that to a large degree. And also you're still going to be in a far better off position long-term than if you just stay on it and stay on it and stay on it. And the other thing I wanted to mention as well, which we've talked about throughout the podcast, but I'm just going to keep on saying it is that if you have gut issues or gut symptoms, you need to start in the gut and that's going to help you astronomically, both with coming off the pill and also addressing the underlying root causes as well. So I just wanted to really reiterate that because it's just, 
just what I do, you know, just keep mm-hmm. talking about the gut health. <laughs> it's um, all about the gut. <laughs> it is. All right. So another really, really common medication or intervention for acne is Roaccutane. And many women don't realize the side effects this can actually have. Can you share some of the drawbacks of using Roaccutane to help women uh, make a more informed decision around this again? Because as we said with the pill, um, your body, your choice, uh, but it's, you know, I feel, and I, I'm sure you're similar, Haley. that it's, it's like people aren't given all of the information or the, the side effects are downplayed. And it's not about fear mongering at all. It's just about here is what are the potential benefits and here are the costs. So do you want to dive into that a little bit more for me? Yeah, exactly. So it's all about being informed and then making a decision based on that information. And look, Roaccutane is a very serious medication. So um, basically, it works by decreasing that sebum production in the skin. So, you know, the sebum causing causing acne. Um, but, you know, for doctors and dermatologists, et cetera, it's actually often considered a last resort because it's only recommended for really severe cases of acne, um, you know, that might not have responded to other treatments. And the reason that it's kind of considered a last resort is because of the serious side effects that are associated with it. So as we sort of talked about before, you know, that sebum is involved in our acne production, but it's also really important to keep our skin healthy generally, like the right level, obviously. Um, and basically the Roaccutane really like decreases sebum production, like, you know, very significantly in the skin. And basically what happens is, you know, a really common side effect of Roaccutane is we get this dry cracking skin. So it can become so fragile, you get bleeding and splitting lips. Um, our skin becomes more sensitive to sunlight. Other side effects include, um, you know, thinning hair, dry eyes, dry throat, uh, nose, nosebleeds, headaches, muscle pains, digestive issues. Um, and you have to be quite careful with alcohol intake and stuff like that too. So that's some of the common side effects of Aracutane. But there's also some really serious side effects that are pretty well documented as well. So One of the most serious ones is the likelihood of birth defects. So it's really important. You know, you can't conceive while you're taking Aracutane. So doctors often recommend that you actually take two forms of birth control while using it. So, you know, that just shows how significant um, that sort of side effect can be. Also, we have the increased risk of liver inflammation. Um, It can cause damage to some of our internal organs. So that's, you know, quite a a big thing too. And the one that's, you know, really scary and really significant for me as well is that the links that Roaccutane has with depression and suicide. So, you know, you have to be very, very conscious and very um, aware of those side effects when taking the medication. Um, So, yeah, Mm -hmm. just being mindful of those things. So, as I said, it's all about that cost to benefit ratio and it should only ever be used as a last resort. Um, And, you know, even when taking the Roaccutane, it can take quite a few months to have a full effect too. So yeah, it's not something that I would be jumping into lightly without, without discussing that pretty, you know, at length with my prescribing practitioner. Mm, Yes. Yeah. I love that. Love all of that. And okay. So a couple of more questions for you or the last question for you before we dive into some rapid fire questions, (laughs) which are my fave. Um, And that is just, you know, as far as non-food or non-supplement related interventions go, is there anything else that you can think of that you feel can make a difference when we're trying to treat acne? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things that I like to chat with, um, chat about with my acne patients is our hygiene. And that's not to say that people who have acne are unhygienic or aren't clean because actually it's often the opposite. You know, these people are often, you know, hyper aware of cleanliness and washing their face too much and stuff like that. But there are some sort of um, hygiene factors that we might overlook or not really think about. So, for example, one of those would be, you know, how often are you actually cleaning your makeup brushes? Like, I know I don't do that often. (laughs) I'm like, um. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. So, (laughs) you know, that's next. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Next one. Um, (laughs) So thinking about about things like that, that we might not have considered. Another one would be, you know, how often are you actually washing your pillowcase? So that needs to be at least once to twice a week because, you know, of the bacterial component implicated in acne as well. So, and this is one that I was totally guilty of, right? How often are you actually touching your face? 
like um, all the time. Exactly. And I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily like popping pimples or whatever, but just subconsciously touching your face, you don't even realize it. So mm. that's a way that we can be, you know, um, spreading bacteria on our skin as well. And this one is actually quite disgusting to think about, but people take their um, phones into the bathroom, right? And then, yes, they do. <laughs> Don't then, lie, everybody. <laughs> and then we hold it to our face when we're talking on the phone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's certain hygiene factors that we might not even be thinking of that could be contributing to, to acne. It's probably not the only thing, but, you know, it's a piece in the puzzle. So let's look at those kinds of things. Um, other things would be, you know, and this one can't be overstated as well. Like, what are we actually putting on our skin? You know, um, Mm -hmm. our skin is such an important organ. It needs to be able to breathe and and what we put on our skin gets absorbed into our body. So it's very important that we're using really nice, clean products. Um, and even just using things like a cream based cleanser instead of a foaming cleanser is such a simple, simple change that we can make because, you know, sometimes those foaming cleansers can strip too much oil from the skin. And then, you know, if we have an upregulation, you know, our skin tries to tries to fix that. So looking at obviously what we're putting on our skin is really important. Um, you know, using things like mineral makeup can be a really um, simple transition too. So, um, you know, our mineral makeups can contain things like zinc oxide, which actually help to protect from sun damage, but also, you know, reducing inflammation and redness as well. So, Um, Yeah, looking at what we're putting on our skin. And, you know, another one that just cannot be overstated, cannot be overlooked is reducing our stress. Our stress Mm. is a big one. So, you know, like we said, our our cortisol, our stress hormone directly interacts with those oil glands. So if we incorporating some stress reduction techniques, so, you know, our breath-based exercises, I know you're a big fan, um, meditation. I know you're a big fan of breathing. (laughs) Yeah, you caught me. <laughs> <laughs> kind of essential. But, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the really deep breathing exercises as well. So that helps to reduce those stress hormones too. So there's lots of different lifestyle factors that we can implement and look at as well. So I think that's really cool because it's not always about taking a million supplements, you know. There's lots of practical things that we can do to help our skin health as well. Mm, love that. Love, love, love it. Okay. So that has been absolutely phenomenal in, ca- in terms of information. And now I want to turn the spotlight onto you, Hayley Brass, and oh. ask you a few of my favorite <laughs> rapid fire questions. So All the right. first one is, are you ready? I'm ready. That's actually not the first one. The first one is, what is your favorite food? Look, this is hard. This is a hard question. So I know. I know, right? But look, I love dark chocolate. I'm not going to lie. Mm. Dark chocolate, my gosh, especially like loco love chocolates. Oh my goodness. But you know, they are, do have a bit of sugar in them. So we have to keep that as definitely a moderation type of thing. Mm. But also I love avocados. I love wild caught salmon. Oh my God. Yum. Mm-hmm. Delicious. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also coffee. And I know, look, you know, coffee oh, I'm so with you. coffee is one of those things it's like oh I love coffee but I just have to be mindful of my relationship with coffee that I don't become Mm. too much of a slave to the bean um yes so there's that but then you know my you know like a desert island food that you feel like if you were stuck on a desert island that you could eat every day for the rest of your life and you'd be happy yes so my version of that would be like a roast veggie salad so I'm talking you know roast pumpkin roast sweet potato roasted like onions with um mixed with like rocket and balsamic like I could literally eat that I reckon every day for the rest of my life delicious Stop it. so but, good sorry so, so good. like six different things because you know, that's, <laughs> that's all right <laughs> I, look when I ask that question to naturopaths or nutritionists I very much expect like you know this is an entree this would be my main yeah. this would be my dessert and then for a sm- and then maybe a beverage on the side. So um, you did really really well. (laughs) All right. Next question is, what are you reading right now? Oh my goodness. Okay. So actually on Audible, but I feel like that still counts. Same, Um, same. Yeah. Same, same. Um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Have you? Oh yes. How freaking like, bam, how good is it? Oh my gosh. Like I actually have had to stop a few times and been like, no, I can't be listening to this book while I'm doing things like doing housework or whatever. I need to actually like be present and absorb this book because it's absolutely, yeah, insane. Like it's such a good book. So for, for people who haven't read it out there, it's basically about 
you know, women in society and how we've been told that we're supposed to, you know, conditioned, I guess, to fulfill certain roles and to kind of hide ourselves and not be our truest self to sort of fit these social, um, you know, stereotypes, etc. So it's kind of about getting back in touch with the newest version of you. Um, yeah, mm. I really recommend it. It's such an amazing read. Yes, love that. Okay, next question is you ha- you're in a funk or having a really shitty day. What do you do to pull yourself out of it? Okay, <laughs> so I have a bit of a confession that, like oh, I am a little bit of, a, for moody, it. a bit of a moody bitch sometimes. So <laughs> that's <laughs> all right. That's <laughs> probably why you're my person. I like that. I can appreciate that. <laughs> when I read it, I was like, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so me. No. Um, so there's definitely a few different things that I do when I'm finding that I'm in a, in a funk or feeling a bit, you know, down or whatever. So the first thing that I like to do is actually kind of just take a moment and think like sort of do a bit of, I guess, self-analysis. Like why am I actually feeling like this? Like am I feeling like this because, you know, I've got some need that hasn't been met? So, for example, like have I not had enough sleep? Have I not looked after myself properly in, what I've, in terms of what I'm eating you know, like, is there a physical reason that I'm feeling like this? Or am I in that certain part of my cycle? So that luteal phase, you know, approaching sort of, you know, premenstrual phase where I should be taking it easy and going inward and, you know, just relaxing a little bit more, taking pressure off myself. Am I in that part of my cycle and I'm pushing too hard? Like, why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? Is it emotional component? Um, Or is it a mindset thing? Like, am I putting too much pressure on myself in some kind of way and then I'm feeling funky because of that. Like I guess so just kind of analysing why I'm feeling the way that I am and then seeing how I can kind of turn that around. So Mm -hmm. that's the first place I start. But also I think it's really important to kind of honour how you're feeling as well. Like don't just brush how you're feeling under the carpet. And sometimes I think, you know, in society, there's this expectation that we're going to be happy and cheery and on top of the world all the time. And that's just not realistic. So I think we need to actually kind of honor those feelings. And, you know, sometimes I'll say to my husband, if I'm in one of these funks, I'd be like, look, I don't know why I feel the way that I do. I just do. I'm going to have a moment here and then I'm going to get over it and I'm going to move on. You know, like I'm not going to live here. I'm not setting up a tent and living here and staying here. I'm having a moment, having a (laughs) moment and then I'm going to move on. Yeah, you've got to feel it to heal it, right? Exactly. You know, exactly. And we can't be on top of the world all the time. That's just not realistic. So first thing would be, I guess, yeah, having a look at why I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling and how, you know, what need might be being unmet that I mindset that I might need to change. So there's that. The other thing is if I want to get in a good mood, the thing that I can do that will instantly put me in a good mood is just put on some good tunes. So um, I, yes, tell me who. Who oh, do you put Beyonce, on? Beyonce. Oh, yes. <laughs> Love that. Seriously, if I put on Run the World, girls, oh, instant right. game changer. Yep, yep, feels, feels. And it's funny, like if I'm ever feeling like, you know, I get a bit low energy or I'm feeling a bit whatever, I'll just put that song on and just like do a crazy dance move around my office and just make myself feel better. So if I ever get on a Zoom call with a a, a uh, patient and I'm a little bit out of breath that might be why because <laughs> I was just dead, <laughs> crazy breath, to be honest, like, in my office just quietly <laughs> oh, that's actually happened to me before I know right <laughs> it's like an instant energy boost instant good it vibe. is so I do that um another thing that I do is actually this sounds a little bit woo woo but you know I'm doing it um is I make a, a space clearing spray you can actually buy these as well but Basically, it's just like an essential oil mix. Um, it's got things mm-hmm. like sage, clary sage, frankincense, etc. I know you're a big essential oils fan too. Um, nice. And so, yeah, I literally just spray that on myself. So it's kind of like a physical thing that I can do to sort of break that emotional. Yeah, I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying when I? Yeah, when yep, I do. Yep, yeah. I get that. To so spray myself with some high vibes. Um, with that? Yep. And then I, you know, I also might just go for a walk or cuddle my dog. So mm. oh, how good, good is a puppy cuddle? I honestly, game changer, absolute game changer. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Next question is what does success mean to you? So this was a, when I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, 
So yeah, no, it's like, how, how do you answer that in a nutshell? Good luck. Go for totally. it. <laughs> Thanks for the stitch up, Nat. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Anytime, girl. <laughs> no, I think, and this probably sounds like totally cliche, but success to me literally just means being happy in who you are and happy in the life that you've kind of created for yourself. So, you know, having good relationships in your life, actually liking the person that you are, I think is really important. But also, you know, so beyond being happy in myself and my relationships, et cetera, you know, the other thing that makes me feel successful and makes me feel happy is getting really great results for my patients. So, you know, I, I heard recently that a patient I've been working with for over 12 months is pregnant and that was what we were working on together. And it literally just like made my life, you know. Oh my so, God, I love those messages. I'm pregnant. I got my period. Yes. Or... Um, here's a picture of my baby, uh, probably some of my favorites, or I just have a really amazing bowel motion. (laughs) (laughs) And they're all on the same level. No, (laughs) (laughs) simple things in life, right? Totally. No, but that's what's that, what success means to me, really being happy and just, yeah, getting results for my patients too. So beautiful. Love that. All right. And lucky, lucky last is what are your three non-negotiables that you do for your health every day? So this might seem like super basic, but basically making sure I'm drinking two litres of water every single day. Like Mm. sometimes it's the simple things that are just foundational, you know, and it's crazy how many people out there don't drink water or don't drink enough water. So, you know, that's a a non-negotiable for me. Um, Also, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not the world's best morning person, but Mm. I'm always trying to improve my morning ritual. So you know, that that space of when you wake up in the morning is almost like sacred to me. And I like to, you know, start my day with a big glass of water. And then I have my coffee, you know, and the world is quiet for that nice first half mm-hmm. an hour of my waking. And there's probably mums out there absolutely rolling their eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but, you know, just taking that moment for yourself um, before the crazy day is really important. And other non-negotiables as well is just looking at ways that we can make what we're eating even more nutritious, you know? So whether that's like adding bone broth to my foods or, you know, just kind of supercharging the foods that I'm eating, making sure you're trying to get vegetables in at every meal where possible. Um, So, you know, that's something that we can do as well. And the other thing is trying to move your body every day as well. So, you know, there's going to be days when you're not going to hit all of these marks, but, you know, whether it's just taking the dog for a walk, you know, there's a lockdown happening here where I am at the moment. So, you know, can't get to the gym and things like that. But, you know, we can still find ways to move our body. Um, Yes, I think I just gave you four, but there we go. You did, but I won't hold it against you because they're a good four. I like that. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. That has been like such an incredible episode so much so much information for people to go away with and I know that there are going to people going to be people listening in being like where can I find you I want to work with you and what I want to invite people to do is a couple of things so if you are someone who you might have acne but you also have gut issues then please make sure you reach out to us because we have a wonderful gut rescue program that includes one-to-one consultations with Haley, and she is more than happy to help you address all of those if you don't have gut issues and you just have skin issues and you're wanting some help, then also please reach out to me um, at support at nataliekdouglas.com or send me a DM and I can make sure that we can get you in to see Haley. And Haley also has her own Instagram, her own website, etc., which I will make sure that I put all of the links in the show notes to. And also when I pop up the post, the Instagram post that relates to this episode, you'll be able to really easily click through that as opposed to me making her spell out every single thing right now. So <laughs> thank you so much again, Haley, And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking with you and feel so privileged to be on your show. Thank you.